Hi, my name is Tim Leung. Let me first thank you for this privilege of spending the next few moments with you. You know, in our world today, it seems that peace is awful hard to find. With all the drama going on around us, chaos seems to reign unchallenged. Well, I want to tell you there's hope. Because I believe that God has a message of peace for us in troubled times. No matter what circumstances you may find yourself in, God's peace is here for you. But first, let me tell you a little story. Once upon a time, there was a kind and generous barber. One day, a priest comes into his shop for a haircut. As the priest got up to pay, the barber says, Oh no, your money is no good. The haircut is on the house. You're a man of the cloth and you provide spiritual and practical care. Accept this gift from me. Please go in peace. The priest thanked him and left. The next morning, the barber gets back to his shop and lo and behold, there's an envelope with 12 gold coins waiting for him. About a week later, a rabbi comes into his shop and the same thing happens. After his haircut is over, our good barber insists that the rabbi accept his gift, saying, You have dedicated your life to teaching the scriptures. Please go in peace. The next morning, the haircutter returns to his shop and notices yet another envelope, this time with 12 glimmering precious gems waiting for him. About a week after that, in walks a Chinese pastor. <laughs> he sits down for his haircut and after it's over our barber friend says, you have dedicated your life to teaching and shepherding your community. Please accept this gift. Go in peace. Delighted, the Chinese pastor gets up to leave. The barber then wonders to himself, hmm, I gave a priest a free haircut and I received 12 gold coins. I gave a rabbi a free haircut and I got 12 precious stones. This time I gave a Chinese pastor a free haircut. I wonder what will be waiting for me this time. Well, early the next day, he gets to his barber shop and sure enough, there in front of his door are 12 Chinese pastors waiting for a free haircut. <laughs> One thing I know from almost 30 years of professional ministry is that we Chinese pastors love anything free. But seriously, we do live in troubled times, don't we? Natural disasters, social unrest, injustice, economic dangers continue to pound and crash us like waves in a storm. The COVID-19 pandemic alone has forever ravaged and changed our world. Now, wildfires are tearing through California, ravaging our state and leaving people homeless. In light of these current events, it seems that the idea of peace is fragile at best and a fantasy in the least. Maybe you're going through some personal tragedy that has rocked your world, threatening to permanently derail your life and shatter your dreams. I myself went through such an experience. Over a year ago, I suffered a life-changing massive stroke. It put me on my back, sent me to the hospital for over three weeks and when I came home, I came home in a wheelchair. I had trouble talking. I couldn't walk. And I was paralyzed on my entire left side. Before the stroke, I made my living by singing, playing the piano and speaking, sometimes four times a week. After the stroke, all of that was gone. Before the stroke, I had two adorable preschoolers that I would love to hoist up upon my shoulders, roughhouse with them, tickle them until tears ran down their face with laughter. I tell you, after the stroke, I couldn't even position my body to sit next to them without searing pain. 
I was so useless we had to rent a hospital bed and put it in our living room so I could spend time with my children. You know, before the stroke, as all little boys do, my son thought there was nothing daddy couldn't do. I remember one time we were watching TV and we were watching some talent show with an acrobat and he was doing some impossible stunt and my little boy unprompted said, my daddy can do that. Now, after the stroke, I felt there was nothing I could do right. Where did I go wrong? I have never been perfect, but ever since my senior year in high school, I've wanted to serve God with all my heart, my soul, my mind, my might, my strength. Here, God left me a broken and crippled old man. How can I possibly find peace under these circumstances? Well, God began to show me a peace that passes all understanding. And I believe with all my heart that God has appointed this time for me to share with you His way to know true peace. True peace, regardless of your circumstances, can be yours. Just like our bar barber friend in our story, God wants to give us a gift. But what is that gift? Let's look at what Jesus says. He says in John 14, I am leaving you with a gift. What is that gift? Peace of mind and heart. And the peace that I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. What do we learn here? First of all, the passage tells us that God wants to give you a gift. That gift is peace that overcomes stress and worry. Now notice, this is a peace that overcomes stress and worry. It doesn't mean that you won't have hardship, you won't have difficult circumstances. You may even wrestle with stress and worry, but God's peace can overcome it. You see, in the early days of my stroke, I thought peace would be mine if only the negative circumstances would just go away. We think that the way to peace is to remove any negative circumstances. Jesus wants to give us a peace so real, so powerful, so rich, that it doesn't come from an absence of hardship, but endures in the midst of hardship. Look what Peter says in the Bible. First Peter 4 says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. The Bible tells us that difficulties and challenges are inevitable. They will come our way. You can't avoid them, but they are actually opportunities to enter into partnership with Jesus. Jesus wants to partner with you. And in that partnership, he wants to share with you his glory and his joy. Eternal joy, brother, sister, friend, is on its way to you if you and I will just partner with Jesus Christ. Moreover, Jesus Christ offers you perfect and unshakable peace and confidence in the middle of any crisis. He will give you the strength and the power and the peace 
to endure and overcome. He doesn't want us to run away from hardship. In any hardship, he wants his people to be the strong ones able to endure and overcome. Isaiah puts it this way, you will keep in perfect peace all, look at that word, circle it man, all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed. I love that word fixed on you. Think of bolted down, cemented, forged. Are our thoughts fixed, anchored, epoxied, super glued? On Christ alone for our hope, our victory, and our peace? Or are we tossed to and fro in the storms of circumstances? You know, the book of James talks about a doubting man, a doubting person. And he says, the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. You need, I need a rock. A solid rock. Jesus is the solid rock upon which to build any successful life. I'll tell you, man, there is no way to build any kind of successful life at all without Jesus Christ as its foundation. In Philippians, Paul says, I have learned to be satisfied with what I have and with whatever happens. I know how to live when I am poor and when I have plenty. I have learned the secret of how to live through any kind of situation. When I have enough to eat or when I am hungry. When I have everything I need or even when I have nothing. What's the secret? Paul says, Christ is the one who gives me the strength I need to do whatever I must do. Do you want that kind of strength to overcome and succeed at any challenge? Paul says the secret is in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ wants you to be unshakable, unbreakable, unfakeable. So what's the key, man? The key is surrendering to Jesus' love and plan for your life. You see, we got a bad connotation about surrender. We think it's a bad word. We think it's a shameful concept. Americans, we love our independence and our autonomy. When I was growing up, I heard this all the time. This is America. <laughs> I heard that. You can't tell me what to do. I have my rights. This is America. And we confuse, I think we confuse autonomy with destiny. Autonomy, we worship autonomy and neglect our, pass up our destiny. Let me explain. I call this the birds gotta fly, fish gotta swim theory, okay? Birds gotta fly. Fish got to swim. You take a bird and you hold it underwater. And unless it's a penguin, you know that bird's not going to make it very long. That bird is not going to be very happy. Because the freest place for a bird to be is in the air. You see, we think that freedom, complete freedom comes when I can do whatever I want anytime I want, anyhow I want, break all the rules. Listen, you take a bird and you hold it underwater, he's not gonna like you breaking that rule because birds don't do well underwater. They do the best when they realize, no experience their ultimate destiny, which is to fly. Same thing with fish. You take a fish, you pull it out of the water, you throw it up on bank, the bank, and that fish is going to gasp and suffer and flop and die. But a fish underwater is like greased lightning. 
It's fast. It's nimble. It's powerful. It's graceful. Because it's where it was created to be. And here is the key, the magic, the secret of surrender. Surrender to God's will for you because he's your creator. He's your designer. He knows what is best for us. And his destiny for us will be the most fulfilling, the most powerful, the most meaningful, satisfying, and peaceful one that could ever be. Peace is yours when you surrender to Jesus. Trust in the Lord, the Bible says, with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There is only one way to know and experience the peace you so crave, and that is with Jesus. Let's go back to our target text. I am leaving you, Jesus says, with a gift. Gift of peace of mind and heart. And the peace that I give is a gift the world cannot give. Look at that. The world can't give it to you. It is a peace the world cannot give you. Now, I remember that when the pandemic started, the governor, Governor Newsom, told us to shelter in place. Now, as busy Americans, many of us tried to go along with it, and we tried to play cool. You know, we compensated. We compensated by baking bread, growing our own vegetables, watching a whole lot of Netflix, immersing ourselves in numerous DIY projects and pursuing hobbies and pastimes. But tell me something, did that bring us peace? I don't think so. People couldn't stand it. Later on, many people, especially young people, they couldn't stand it any longer. And in order to silence the screaming cacophony of unrest in their souls, they went out and partied anyway. They went to bars, they went to pool parties, they went to beaches, they couldn't stay home. Did it help? Did it satisfy the loneliness of the human heart? No, man. No. Now, this is not just my opinion. The American Medical Association, the AMA, they stated, now this is not the Bible, this is not me, they stated depression and anxiety are prevalent during COVID-19. Even such notable people like former First Lady Michelle Obama has alluded to a smoldering level of persistent depress depression recently. Not only here, Across the pond, twice as many Brits this year, 19.2% complain or consider themselves depressed than just last year. The stress has taken its toll. You say, no, no, it's just a little hiccup. Nobody's really bothered by it. Listen, man, the stress has taken its toll. In 25 large U.S. cities, murder, that's right, man, murder is up 16.1 so far this year alone. And this year is far from over. Think about it. People are freaking out. They can't handle it. They're killing people because it's just too much. And right here in California, a certain Dr. Mike de Bois Blanc of the John Muir Medical Center in Walnut Creek. You might know where that is. He stated on May 21st, 2020, the numbers of suicides are unprecedented. We've seen a year's worth of suicide attempts in the last four weeks. What does this tell us? 
this tells us that Jesus' words ring true. The world cannot give you the peace you and I are looking for. You hear that? The world cannot give you the peace that you are looking and longing for. We think that our problem is our external circumstances. Even Christians fall for this all the time. Oh, I'm not happy. Oh, I'm not fulfilled. Oh, I'm not at peace. Why? Because the things in my life suck. If I could only change where I live, if I could only change what I do, if I could only make more money, if only I was married to someone else. I call this houses, hobbies, and honeys, right? I don't like my house. I buy a bigger one. I'm unfulfilled. I take on a new hobby. I'm not satisfied. I get rid of my spouse. House, houses, hobbies, and honeys. But you know, if we hang on to our external circumstances as our means for peace and fulfillment, the Bible says things will get worse before they get better. One time Jesus was asked by his closest friends, Lord, tell us what will be the signs of your coming? When you come back again to set up your kingdom, when it's the end of the world, what's it going to be like? Can you give us any clues, any hints? Jesus says, I'll give you a whole bunch of clues. Here's some. You will soon hear about wars and threats of wars, but don't be afraid. These things will have to happen first. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes and in various places plagues like COVID-19 and famines. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. You know, in every age there are people who say, you know, the sky is falling, it's the end of the world. You know, is this just in our mind? Is it because we've got better news coverage? I mean, what is it? Is, is there some objective source? Well, let's take a look at a few graphs from non-biblical sources. Here we have one. Militarized disputes between pairs of countries since 1870. Okay, let's take a mega view. Let's take a big view of things. 1870 to 1990s. Look at that. It goes up and down, of course, but we see a steady march in the number of military disputes. Let's look at earthquakes. Jesus says there will be many more earthquakes and they'll come more and more and more frequently and in more intensity. Here we have a graph. We have a little chart that breaks down earthquakes in small, medium, and mega quakes from 1975 it's clear the trend is definitely up way up and this one only goes to 2009 let's look at something a little more recent from 1982 to 2015 earthquakes magnitude 6.0 and more are way way up that arrow goes straight out. Natural disasters. How about all natural disasters? I don't know. Famines, uh, um, pestilence, earthquakes, storms, tsunamis. I don't know what they took into consideration here. But from the year 1900 to the year 2000, the natural disasters are going off the charts. Coincidence? Skewed interpretation of data? Or is this God's way of warning us that time is about to end? Jesus Christ is telling us that if you and I put our 
faith and hope and trust in the circumstances of this world, even the ground upon which we walk is not solid enough to save you. Why would God do this? What is the message here? Does Jesus want to scare us? No. Jesus wants us to have peace. I have told you these things, Jesus says, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. You know, Jesus is bigger than the world. Jesus is bigger than the economy. Jesus is bigger than your boss. Jesus is bigger than COVID-19. Jesus is bigger than the threat of homelessness. Jesus is bigger. And the Bible tells us he is near. So then why don't people, more people experience this peace of God? Why? Because the Bible tells us of the universal human condition. Each and every person on the planet was born with a spiritual disease, if it were. We are separated from God by our independence, our narcissism, and our human tendency and bent towards self-survival. Ask any parent and they'll tell you, kids do not come out like little angels. The ability to lie, the ability to steal, the ability to cause trouble, every child comes with the potential for chaos. And it's because Every human being is basically selfish. That's how we are. We watch out for number one. And that is part of the human condition. The problem with that is it separates us from God. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are separated from God by a huge gulf that none of us can get across, no matter how hard we try. So what do we need to do? Number one, step one, admit. Admit that I am separated from God's peace and I cannot save myself. You see, the problem is that we often try to save ourselves through our work, through our contributions, through um, our self-image. You see, good works cannot save us. Religion cannot save us. Money can't save us. We can't throw money at the problem. Even being a good, basically moral and ethical person is not good enough. We are all infected and impure with what the Bible calls sin. When we display our righteous deeds even, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. If we compare our merit with other people, we can always find someone who's worse than us. If I were to compare myself with others, I'd compare myself with Hitler, or Mao Zedong, or Stalin or Hannibal Lecter because compared to them I look pretty good how would I look if I compared myself to Mother Teresa I couldn't compare with her the problem is God's standard of righteousness is not even Mother Teresa but it is Jesus Christ himself whose righteousness is going to be enough to measure with Jesus what's God's solution the free gift of grace. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, 
so that no one can boast. You see, it's not about merit. It's not about what I can do. It's not about how much money I give. It's about Jesus Christ. Number two, believe Jesus is the only way to know God's peace. There's a dear friend of mine. He's a tremendous guitar player. and We would, uh, in the past, go to various music stores and guitar shops. And inevitably, upon entry in every guitar shop, I'd hear some guitarist in the corner playing, guess what? Yep, Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> There's only one real Stairway to Heaven. You can't build your own. You need Jesus Christ to provide you a bridge, a stairway to get from here to there. You see, God proves his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Greater love, Jesus says, has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And that's what God did. What does grace mean? Grace means unmerited favor. That means God chooses to like you. And he has chosen to like you, my friend. And he wants you with him, in relationship with him, to know his peace forever. And he wants to give it to you through the gift of his son, Jesus. You see, Jesus knew we could never gain it on our own merit. And so he died the ultimate price. He sacrificed his own life so that you and I could know his friendship forever. How do you know God loves you? Because God loved you enough to send his son to die for you and me while we were still in rebellion and autonomy from him. That has never meant more to me than since I became a father. I married late in life and I became a father late in life. And nothing, I tell you, nothing could prepare me for that horrific vulnerability of loving someone that much. I remember the first night of my son's life, he couldn't sleep, he cried constantly. And there in the hospital room, the only way we could get him to quiet down and go to sleep was if I held him in my arms and sang to him. And that's what I did all night. I was blown away. I loved him so much, it was scary. Because there was suddenly someone that I would do anything for. That I was absolutely helpless in love with him. And I would give up anything for that little man. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Parents, can you relate to that? Would you give up your child for someone else? For a co-worker, for a neighbor, for an associate? Would you choose one? How would you choose? Would you choose the smallest one? Would you choose the ugliest one? <laughs> would you choose the one with the lowest GPA? How could you give up one of your children, not even for a friend, but for an enemy? And yet that's what God did. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You see, people have the wrong idea about Christians. God is not a God of condemnation. God is a God of salvation. He wants to save you, to bring you into a relationship with himself, and to offer you and give you and fill your life with the peace that only knowing Jesus can give you. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, freely give us all things? 
Mind has not the ability to conceive. Eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. It is unfathomable to the imagination the blessings God has for you. Receive Him today. Receive Him personally. And you can know His peace and His love. The Bible promises you, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The adoption papers are typed up. They're presented before you. God wants you as his child. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Simply put, perhaps you've seen this on a bumper sticker somewhere. No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. Jesus offers a relationship with him where you can know the unconditional love and forgiveness of God and that peace and security of being his child forever and ever. The time to take advantage of this is now. Tomorrow may well be too late, my friend. He puts it this way. In Matthew, come to me, come to me, all of you who are weary and loaded down with burdens, and I will give you rest. Place my yoke. What's a yoke? A symbol of relationship and responsibility. Place my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am gentle and humble and you will find rest for your soul. Because my yoke is pleasant and my burden is light. Are you tired? Are you weary today? Don't turn away. Come to him. Now, Jesus has planned for this moment before the foundations of this world. And he wants you to come home to him. Say this prayer. Dear God. I thank you for sending your only son, Jesus, to die for me and to be raised again for me in order for me to become your child and to know your everlasting peace. I admit that I have lived my life independent of you and wish to accept your free gift of a relationship with Jesus forever. Please wash away the mistakes of my past and give me a new life with Jesus as my leader. Please fill my heart with your peace and take me to live with you in heaven for all eternity when my time here is through. Teach me to grow as I study your word, the Bible, and spend time with you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. I sincerely hope you said that prayer with me. If you did, God heard you. And today, he is preparing a place for you in paradise forever.